Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Nostrad Stern, Oklahoma State University's Peter Guest Artist Lecture Series. I'm Professor J.B. Oshimoto with Northwestern um, Studio Art Department. Today we are joined by uh, visual artist and uh, cartoonist Lauren Perji from Brooklyn, New York, uh, originally hailing from Ohio. Thank you for joining us today, Lauren. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Thanks for inviting me and having me. So Ms. Perji is a fantastic uh, uh, um, uh, cartoonist. Uh, her work is um, the scene uh, regularly on Hyperallergic, and uh, she posts, uh, uh, I believe, on Mondays. Um, could you, would you want to talk about how you originally got started with uh, your comics and your paintings and whatnot? Um, yeah. So I guess I will just go straight into the, the pictures for that. Um, sure. Let's see here. Screen share. Uh, here we oh, go. See it? See yourself? I certainly do. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm just going to briefly go over painting for me because I, you know, kind of stumbled into comics, uh, went to school at Ohio University in Athens. Um, with a painting degree. Um, drawing and painting is pretty similar, but uh, I went into school very much interested in traditional techniques and painting realistically and using oils. And it wasn't about till two years in where I started incorporating the cartoons into the work. Um, so this was actually not done in school. This is after school, but it kind of shows that transition, I guess, between, or juxtaposition of painting and cartoons and how I was using it, or still I'm using it. Mm -hmm. um, comics have kind of been this other section of my life, my art, um, but it all kind of melds together in a certain way. Um, so yeah, these are my paintings. But since this is a class about comics, I won't talk about them too much. <laughs> Do you want to give us the scale of your paintings here? Oh, these are these are pretty small. They're about 18 by 24s. All of these okay. made a series of um, these uh, 18 by 24s. Some were maybe 30 by 24. Not okay. very large. Um, when I moved to New York uh, about four years ago. Uh, painting kind of was hard because I had two or three roommates at a time. My paintings got a lot smaller, um, and I started drawing a whole lot more just because of that. It was so much easier to work around with space and storage and all of that. You still paint, but it's you know not as huge as it could be. And so then there's paintings like this too, which I'm incorporating text and basically drawings that I consider this not really a comic strip, but um, has those elements of text and image working together. So if, if I may, what role did the text uh, come in for you at this time? Like, why, why, why this uh, addition to the text? Uh, uh, what helped you? What made, where, where did that decision come from to use the text? Um, it was certain artists that I saw using it, like Ray Pettibon. Um, it's, well, it's a very easy way to communicate an idea with text. And uh, when you're using it alongside images, um, you want the image to be something that doesn't work by itself, and you want the text not to work by itself. And this is how I approach comics, too. Um, you want there to be a reason or a way that they're working together. And that was just that became really interesting to me. Plus, I'm really into music, um, lyrics, and I was incorporating a lot of that sort of thing into the art, into the drawings. Um, it just felt right, I guess. There wasn't a huge philosophical reason of doing it. Um, so, in that in that regard, what what type of musicians and lyrics uh, are do you draw inspirations from the most? Oh well, um, and I sneak them into my comics a lot. Uh, not many people notice it, I don't think. But Tom Waits is my biggest uh, influence, I'd say. Uh, storytellers, 
um, Nick Cave, Bob Dylan. Uh, just, right. Man, just a lot of, a lot of things. Okay. Um, so yeah. So then in school, uh, I started getting into comics. I, I found a few artists like Jeffrey Brown, who's mm -hmm. He does a lot of autobiographical things, and it was something that I didn't consider, like, me feasibly doing until I saw how he was doing it. It's very simple, straightforward, uh, honest, very honest um, stories about his own life. And I was like, hey, that, that looks like a lot of fun. Um, painting being very conceptually based and open-ended comics were more, you know, you get straight to the point as quickly as possible with a painting you want it to exist uh, for someone else to imply their own narratives and for them to look at it for a long period of time whereas a comic you expect them to only look at it for about 10 seconds you know to read so um, that's my approach with it at least other comic artists don't do that but um, so, and as far as character design how do you come up with like say in this case Vladimir and Estragon um, so this, um, when I decided I wanted to kind of get into comics or making my own, uh, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my own characters, so I made up a class, basically an independent study, to remake Waiting for Godot <laughs> by Samuel Beckett into a comic book. And um, so I did that. I was just doing pen and uh, charcoal. And it was, I don't know, maybe 90 pages or something. And But once that was over, I felt like I had this relationship with these two characters from the play, Vladimir and Estragon, so I wanted to keep it going. So I started doing a strip at that point. And that was, I guess, a big breakthrough for me, putting my own ideas into my comics and not being guided by a play. Um, and so that lasted a while, but basically it was just something I did in college because I was... It was almost just for me and my friends in a certain way. I was trying to make my friends laugh. Um, yeah. So once outside of college, I didn't feel like it was as relevant, fizzled out after a while. So this is one of the old strips. Okay. When did uh, your personal character start coming into play? Uh, so I guess it was after that. I still was interested in making comics. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess it was after school, and this is like when I moved to New York. Um, I was trying to take my observations of the art world because I was was either working in an art store as artist assistants all the time, like it was my life, and you know I was making work about it. So this was just kind of like a smart ass. These are the trends that I'm seeing, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and this is the first one that Hyperallergic uh, saw and asked to run. And I guess it did well enough that they asked me to start doing a weekly, and that was about two years ago. Right. It was just a happy coincidence, though. Yeah. It seems like you mentioned about how your previous comic in college was about more like a, your inner circle, your, almost like an inside joke between you and your friends. Right. Right. This is, gets a little bit more broader. It still that has the same uh, quality of like an inside joke among the art artists in our world. And uh, unless you are in the art world, it's hard in some ways. In so, it's hard to get some of this thing. But at the same time, it's also very accessible too because it kind of speaks on the ridiculousness of uh, the art world sometimes. So, right. Right. Yeah. And I feel I'm probably at least five of these things. But you know, I was trying to put you know, performance art over here and you know Jackson over here. I literally saw a piece in Chelsea that was just a ladder that you couldn't climb. Yeah. Um, you know, Jeff Koons down here, and mm -hmm. I guess this could be a little Andy Warhol going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this one isn't my character, but I was doing my character at this point, too. Um, mm -hmm. This could be just anything, really. Yeah. Here's one of the early ones. Um, okay. I don't know if you 
kind of read them, but this was, um, so this was before Hyperallergic 2, um, trying to figure out what my place was in the art world that I clearly had some disdain for, um, and what I was going to do with my own art, because uh, making the move to New York, you kind of need to make those decisions, and I hadn't really, I just wanted to see what would happen, and a professor of mine uh, who keeps in touch and is sort of a mentor for me had just asked me to start, you know, writing out my goals and working backwards from that. And so this was kind of my smart ass <laughs> reply. I just sent him a comic back about this is my my goal. I want a following and I want to cheat death by leaving an unforgettable legacy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> Which is what all artists are really doing if you think about it, right? Yeah. And I think Lawrence could definitely relate to this particular comic uh, because it touches uh, so honestly uh, on the, the same uh, efforts and struggles that everybody goes through. Yeah. 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 And uh, so could you uh, talk about uh, your character here? I mean, I know it's sort of so, uh, almost like a, a soul portraiture in a way, but also uh, it's a little bit different from how you draw uh, the Lauren character now. Uh, you like physically? Or yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, my character got shorter and fatter. That's one thing. Uh, <laughs> I what? don't know. You know, like this just fits on one page right. uh, easily. But uh, were, were there certain aesthetic decisions to, uh, to make your character shorter, or it just kind of happened naturally? I th it just happened, to be honest. It fit better in certain places, I think. And, Right. Um, it's funny, you look at other cartoonists and their characters kind of evolve in that way too. The Simpsons, if you see like those beginning episodes, they look so funny and bad in a certain way. Yeah. This isn't necessarily bad, but yeah, it's a little different. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that your work is bad. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's very really interesting and different. Uh, and to see where your comic is now, it's, uh, it's kind of like a nice throwback to how the, to how the origin started. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that I stick more to the squares and the rectangles now. Um, but it's always been kind of, I don't sketch out a whole lot before. I do the writing mm -hmm. before, and that takes hours and hours, days sometimes to, like, figure out exactly what I want to say, but when it comes time to, like, putting it on the page, I get really uh, anxious, I guess, for it to just be over. So I do it pretty intuitively. Right. Uh, so um, what's the writing process like then? Uh, do you just uh, do you go to a place uh, where it's nice and quiet and then try to figure something out, or do you, uh, are there some stuff that's right floating in your mind that you just kind of pick from and then just write about, or how does that work? Yeah. Um, I don't know how other comic people do it because I think it's really difficult to do the writing. Um, it's the, the most fun part of making comics for me. I feel like most creative, but now I'm only doing um, a comic for Hyperallergic every two weeks instead of a weekly. Mm -hmm. um, but throughout those two weeks, I'm actively thinking about it, or, or not, maybe not actively, maybe indirectly. I'm taking things from conversations that I hear, um, things that I read, so I'm like taking notes throughout the weeks. Um, and then I have that day, it was yesterday actually, where it's like time to sit down and, and try and put it all into something, you know. I go into it thinking I have a clear idea, but it never works out. Like last minute it always becomes something totally different. Um, so I write pages and pages and in really nonsensical ways and repeat sentences and take out words and mm -hmm. that part's fun for me. The drawing part actually is not very fun. <laughs> wow, so um, editing the writing is the most fun for you. It, yeah, at that point I'm just like so, I, I want it to be over. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very much more involved in the writing process, which is something that definitely changed throughout. Like in the beginning, I was probably more interested in how it looked than I am now. Okay. How it's written. Where do you think that transition happened? It just 
uh, again, was it just more like an organic, natural thing, or did you make that conscious decision at one point? Um, yeah, it was definitely not conscious. Uh, I guess it, I just got more involved in it, um, like, for lack of better words, just uh, not having an idea. Because there are definitely certain weeks where it's like, I feel like I have nothing, and like maybe I should quit, you know, sort of thing, <laughs> sort of feelings. And writing, if I'm not just scribbling down everything that comes to mind, really nothing will come out. It's forcing an idea, um, and brainstorming is is a lot of fun. So. Uh, Okay, so when you... That didn't really answer your question, did it? <laughs> um, Not sure. So when, you, when you translate your uh, writing into the comic form, obviously it needs to be uh, balanced out by your uh, visual drawings, but uh, what, uh, what's the process as far as like uh, uh, incorporating to the, uh, the first panel into the final panel to kind of wrap things up? Like, is there, uh, how do you balance uh, your writing to fit within those uh, constraints of your uh, panels? It's, it is a tremendous amount of editing, mm -hmm. and um, I, truly, I definitely believe that comics need to be as simple as possible. There's a few words in there that maybe you put in for some aesthetic value, or not aesthetic value, um, mm -hmm. cadence or something of the words, but uh, it's like I'm, I'm just trying to get it down to as little... Uh, amount of words and amount of panels. Like if this, if I felt like this could be a one panel, I would do that. But um, it didn't. You know, sometimes you need a little breathing room. Um, so just a lot of editing, a lot of editing. So when you make uh, comics such as this one for Hyperallergic, is are, are there certain uh, constraints that you have to work with? Like, do they say, hey, here's here, I want you to do a six-panel comic strip or four panels, or what, how does that work with you and the uh, Um No, I guess I was really lucky to be the first comic artist for them because I maybe that was kind of an experiment on their part, and also for me, I never did anything other than maybe posting on Facebook or right. a blog. Um, it, I mean, it's there's little to no restrictions except for you need it to be uh, readable mm -hmm. at whatever it is, I think 640 pixels across. It could be as long as you want it. Um, that That's basically the only restriction. I've kind of set up the system of what my comic strips are about and, and everything else. They've never really said no to any, they're allowed to say no, I can give them something and they could say we're not going to run this, but it thankfully hasn't happened, they they let me do what I want, basically. That's um, great. Yeah. So, yeah. when you draw your uh, strips, uh, do you do it on, uh, on with a like, pencil and pen and on paper, or do you do it digitally, or what's your process as far as like um, trans uh, translating your uh, comic? Um, well, this one here, I know it's probably three pages uh, with two panels on each one. Um, I very loosely sketch it out. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like those bunnies, I probably draw sketches of mm -hmm. each individual one, but I'll have, like, you know, where her head is, basically. And right. the, the text is actually harder to, to constrain sometimes uh, and takes a little bit more... Uh, thinking beforehand, but again, it's a pretty intuitive, and I want to keep it that way. I don't want to overthink it a whole lot. Um, okay. So, yeah. So they are done on paper and not on mm -hmm. computer necessarily. Yeah, and then I just go at it with ink, and and yeah, again, this one it was three pages, so I I don't do anything on the computer. Just I mean, because I hate it, I mm -hmm. hate doing work on computers, and I'm. <laughs> avoid it at all costs. It just gives me absolutely no joy. Um, even just scanning things, just, ugh, hate it. Um, so I just kind of up the contrast and the exposure. Right. Uh, you have the clear white and black. Yeah, that's pretty okay. much all. Great. 
I'm just going to flip through while we talk. I don't know. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess as far as the evolution of the comics, too, um, I've, I feel like it's been more recently where I've tried to put a little bit more narrative into it. Um, this one, like, kind of going back, there's a lot of self-reflection when it comes to these comics, because it is my character. It's supposed to be, or it is me. Um, right. It's really hard for me to draw that line between this pers this character and who I am. Um, so, you know, I, I started going back and thinking, um, what was it that makes made me an artist to begin with? Um, right. And it's all the things that were wrong with me. <laughs> I'm a terribly anxious person, and I really hate social settings. And it's funny how that I feel like that made me into an artist because you have your own personal thing going on, and it's a way to connect to people without physically being around them or talking to them. But now uh, when you start an art career, uh, those problems are not <laughs> really helpful anymore. This is like an opening that right. I had the week before, and I, I, I mean, this did happen. I thought about running away. I went out and had a cigarette. Yeah. Um, and then you, too, asking me to do this lecture about the <laughs> same time that the Art Students League wants me to do one now, too, in December. And, right. yeah, I'm probably not going to make it through that. But I'll try uh I think you'll be fine. Um, but I, as far as your comic, I think this is uh, uh, what uh, makes your work so uh, sincere, authentic, and very powerful that people can relate to because it's such a way to open up your heart, and I, I think people can understand that. And that's why I, I think people love your comic uh, the way they do. It's just uh, such a, an honest way to look at what an artist's mind goes through. Um, and uh, you, you're putting it out there, and I think that's a great way to uh, talk about some of the anxiety you uh, uh, go through. And um, this strip in particular somehow, somehow reminds me of uh, the one you put up yesterday as well, or today rather. So that's. Uh, well, I think I actually have that, so I, okay. I thought it would come up. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's very similar. I mean, there's a there's a bit of uh, self-deprecation going on in all the comics, uh, but in a humorous way that... I mean, sometimes I go into these, and I know they're going to get run the next day, and I'm just, like, praying that just one person or a handful of people can relate to it, because I not really sure of myself or how many other people have these problems so it's very validating when something gets shared and liked and all that weird yeah. stuff. And I, uh, you, there's something that's uh, very special about the way you write too, like in the fi uh, final panel uh, where, where you're Lauren is saying misery is familiar and it's and comforting, let's hug, and that's, that's like a you know, nail in the coffin, it just totally nails it on the head. I get, so it makes sense for, I think, a lot of visual artists. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's got that weird sense of sweetness that it, that makes the uh, com your comic that much more charming. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, again, that makes uh, another element, uh, as still another element to uh, make, it, make it more relatable. So, yeah. Yeah, great. And uh, it, it doesn't really even come out of nowhere, too. I mean, somebody literally just sent me a message the other day about another artist, and you're just like, I just feel like I can't talk to anyone, and I was kind of in the same boat after I've been like locked up in my room for a while uh, yeah. making art for myself, and so that's where this came in. I mean, but I went into this yesterday thinking I was going to make a comic about insecurity. I was like so involved in that and wrote for hours about that, and then again, last minute, it just became about this. Yeah. But it worked. It seems like it worked out just fine. Um, and what's interesting is that the first two panels is a lot more, I guess, illustrative in a way because it's it's got these beautiful drawings of the of the mice up, up top, and then it switches the aesthetic style into the more of your uh, uh, comic style. Um, so I find that transition very interesting too. It's, uh, it shows off your abilities in like um, multiple ways of um, 
knowing how to draw. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I do know how to draw. It's funny because I don't. I don't. I go at this as quickly as possible. I almost feel like it's more honest when it looks like it's been. It's kind of unfinished, or not unfinished, but naive. Uh, that's something that I think I stole from Jeffrey Brown as well because I remember being really affected by that because I, I could imagine him sitting in a coffee shop for a night and just making pages and pages with just, you know, a pencil and a notebook. And I do it a little bit more finished nowadays than maybe I did in the past. But, um, but yeah, there's something that seems, it's like a trick to make it seem honest or uh, uh, truthful. Um, so let me ask you a technical question as far as like this uh, particular panel goes. I noticed that there's uh, definitely some shading and whatnot. Do you use like like uh, like a sumi ink or watercolor? Or what do you use to shade? Your, oh, uh, shading. So that's yeah. kind of a recent thing too. I didn't do that for a while. Uh, I guess I'm looking at a got some waterproof India ink is what I use. It's basically what I had lying around. So the pens themselves, I always use pit pens, paper castell. I'm obsessed with those. Um, do you yeah. just, well, what, what type of tip do you use? Do you use like a brush tip or do you use just uh, like a fine tip or uh, is there, do you switch it up depending on the strip or what do you do? For the shading, it's just a paintbrush. Uh, for the, the other, uh, the line work, it's just it's not a brush tip. It's just a small mm -hmm. or fine point, I guess. It's supposed to be consistent, but, you know, these pens, they kind of crap out on you at the worst times. Um, <laughs> yeah, they do that. But, well, it's, it adds some interest to you. You work with your limitations um, or mistakes. Working with mistakes is kind of wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Let's see some of your other scripts as well. Um, it would be nice to see the transition that you made into, up to that point. And so let's see. How did you? Okay. So this is a, a chronology of uh, Lawrence altogether in one, or this is Lauren talking to past Lauren talking to past Lauren talking to past Lauren. Um, there's another artist. Um. I had a kid around, like an intern almost, following me around for a few months, uh, right. which was a really interesting experience. She knew so much more about comics than I do. Like I, I honestly don't read a whole lot. Uh, it just is something that I do. Um, mm -hmm. which is, I should probably read them more since now I'm viewed as a comic artist. Um, yeah. But she just told me about this one. I didn't even get to read it. She couldn't find it, but it was a, a person talking to their past kid self and what they would talk to or what they would say to them and vice versa, both sides. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to steal that idea. And then it became, I was trying to make it a really short comic, and then it became this where uh, I felt like there are certain stages in my life that I had mm -hmm. uh, ego and um, what I would say to them then. Um, and then, of course, ending with dead Lauren. <laughs> the ghost Lauren. <laughs> um, so could you talk about your uh, layout designs, like how you uh, lay out your panels? Like, is, that, is that also more intuitive, or does that uh, change depending on, upon what you write? Um, or, when do you make that aesthetic the writing, decision? The writing determines it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think, like, something like this, uh, I believe it was this idea that I thought was a great idea of making a timeline, um, mm -hmm. that made this, but there's, you know, there's certain things about comics that are just there for you to use, like, you, you know that someone le reads left to right, top to bottom, and you just run with that. There's one, yeah, this this one, actually. That was handy. Um, I was really involved with the layout of this, trying to make the um, mm -hmm. 
There's a question we all get and sort of dread. How long did it take you to make this? Because, uh, again, even with the comics, it's like I'm writing for weeks and trying to work out ideas, and then it could maybe only take 10 minutes to draw. So I hate that question. Um, so this, yeah, this is just, I don't need panels for this, because you're going to go and read this and that and that and have this flow throughout and, and you know, the bottom right corner. Um, pretty simple, you know. Yeah. It's straight to the point. It uh, definitely uh, catches uh, everything into that uh, to make your point. Um, and I think uh, you're, you're right. Uh, that is a very loaded question. A lot of people think, oh, you know, how long did it take for you physically to make that? Like, you know, can, you can't just say, hey, uh, a couple of hours when you know, Got all these things involved in actually making the work, so and it could be like years of experience that uh, got to culminate to that one small thing of drawing. So, yeah, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Great. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the day to how much I really want to get into the visual part of it. This, I think, mm -hmm. I was interested in breaking out of the panels um, mm -hmm. and make it this more thought cloud, I guess. Um, yeah. So when you make a comic, uh, when you sit down and make that decision, do you uh, do you have a certain ritual? Do you uh, uh, put yourself in like a, a quiet place or anything like that? Do you have like a music you listen to to get to get started, or uh, what's uh, what kind of environment uh, and the state of mind do you put yourself in when making? Yeah. Uh... Oh, man, it's pretty ridiculous. Well, one time somebody was just like, can we video you, like, drawing a comic and doing, like, a time lapse? And I was like, half of that time lapse is going to be me singing to myself and drumming on on a sketchbook. Yeah, I'm really, really involved with music. I'm listening to it constantly. Um, so I'm usually turning that up pretty loud uh, and just get... get Real into my own head, I guess. Um, sitting at my desk, got my lights, got my pens all next to me. I don't have any reason to get up or move. And I do make that time for myself where, you know, if I don't want to do it, it doesn't matter. I have to, like, just force myself to get involved. And music helps me get into that mindset, I guess. Right. So, yeah. so if uh, music plays such a big part in your preparation and making your strip, uh, how I mean, how much of an impact does it have on your actual writing and your actual comic strip? And you know, how often do your musicians actually pop up in the strips? That's true. Maybe I don't know if I have any in this. Oh shit! I don't want to show you that yet. <laughs> <laughs> um. No, there are some that. I word for word. Maybe I can pull one up. This is not going to work, is it? Well, uh, um, that's okay. I, I, yeah, sometimes it's kind of like just for myself. I like to mm -hmm. put myself on the same level as my favorite artists, like Tom Waits. So there's one. Actually, there's a couple where the characters are meant to resemble. Tom Waits himself, and a few weeks ago I did one with Nick Cave. Um, lyrics are made into titles. There's one about, uh, I was comparing artists to uh, Sisyphus, Rolling Rock Up the Mountain. It was called Stone Blind Love, which is a song by Tom Waits. And, um, yeah, Bob Dylan has snuck its way in there. Um, that's really just for me, I guess, and hoping that maybe some other fan might see it. It's just trying to connect all the time. It's just trying to connect with people that are like me. Um, yeah. And uh, that's also interesting because there was one comic that you had, I think you made for students, uh, in particular about being a sponge and uh, being influenced by everything that you can and uh, using that in your creative outlet. Um, and I think that's a, a, a very good thing that uh, um, you, know, uh, you do with your own personal practice. Like you are uh, drawing inspirations from so many different things in your life, be it music or other conversations you have with people, and it's, uh, you are setting a pretty good example by putting it forth on your comic. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge 
film, music, literature. Um, actually, I have a really short attention span. I think that's why I'm a visual artist, because you're putting it all into one thing. Um, I love music, but a certain part of me doesn't want to study it, because I feel like when you start so, like, when you're a kid, art is all about fun and creativity, and but it becomes a job, you know, and you study it to death and overanalyze everything. Uh, I don't want to do that to music. Music is still kind of very sacred in that way that I don't know a lot about it. I just know what I like, and that's enough. Um, reading is also really important to me. Um, uh, again, well, I don't have a really great attention span, but I'll, I'm often like reading from two different books, which is, is fun because you start to make these connections with things. Um, that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. So you're just kind of, we're all, artists are always just stealing ideas, I feel like, and making them into something, like shoving it all together. Um, right. We're going to idea into yeah. something else. Yeah, makes it something new. And, uh, okay. Yeah. So would you be willing to talk about how you just sort of mentioned that you had a sort of short attention span, but I imagine to be able to write uh, for as long as you have to, to draw these strips, takes you quite a bit of effort and time. So uh, how does the you know, these comic book, uh, comic strip making uh, help you uh, fo focus your uh, um, your attention or whatnot? Does it help you? or? Uh, uh, well, I feel like they're pretty short. You know, I envy um, people that can make a long narrative uh, comic book or graphic novel, and I'm trying to work up to that point. I have a few stories that are about 10 pages long, that I have, you know, really, I haven't gotten it down to what I want it to be. Um, I feel like this is pretty short. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, do we want to look at uh, another, another strip? Yes, let's see. Okay, we're going backwards. Here's one. Um, comparing being an artist to uh, an alcoholic, uh, <laughs> um, the evolution mm -hmm. of, um, of that. Uh, I don't know. There's not a whole lot to talk about. Let me see. Okay. I'm trying to find. This was influenced by music in a way. Actually, I had a terrible few weeks. Um, like with current world news and feeling very helpless and that the world is really just going down the shitter. Uh, had that moment that I think maybe a lot of artists have um, where we think we're, what we're doing is pretty insignificant to the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And um, I came out of it listening to uh, John Lennon's Imagine on repeat, which is really cheesy. Mm -hmm. But it, it helped me. It helped me in a certain way and decided I would make this comic that would, I thought everyone would think was very good, but I actually got some some people calling me a hippie after this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, keeping your work personal and not doing it for for money. Uh, right. It's got a very positive message. At the end I of thought it was very positive. A lot, some people took it as... Um, mm -hmm the opposite, like that I think that artists shouldn't get paid and shouldn't do things for their resume, but look at, I mean, this comic, I got paid for this comic, it's on a blog, uh, you know, uh, I think it looks pretty good on my resume to be on Hyperallergic, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, but it, it doesn't start with that, you know, it starts with, you gotta yes. do it because you love it. And right, just look at it. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Oh, this one, an old one. Uh, just a silly thought that is plausible of how artists evolved. <laughs> I'm not very good at sports, so I wouldn't be good at hunting. I would probably be the cave woman that was left in the in the cave drawing on the walls. I mean, it's possible, right? <laughs> oh, let's see. Expectations. 
Oh, you know, it's also... Uh, so, she's a painter. Uh -huh. I, and more in the beginning... This is a stupid little anecdote, but more in the beginning, I was painting a lot, so the character was always painting. Um, and more recently, I've shown the character at her desk, because that's mm -hmm. more what I'm doing. Um, right. But this is a relationship that I think all artists and writers can kind of see. Right. I, I think this is very relatable for anybody that paints, especially when uh, people are contemplating such meaningful thing in their work, and then yeah. you have an audience that says, hey, I like the clouds, I like blue. That, that happens a lot, I think. And, um, people don't yeah. know what to say. Yeah. Well, I think art is a very personal thing, and... I mean, even for me, like, the art that I really enjoy, I don't like talking about it because it almost ruins it when you start having a dialogue with someone else that maybe doesn't agree with you completely. Um, once out of college, you don't have to criticize if you don't want to. I mean, you're kind of forced to critique each other when you're in school. Uh, I was really happy to get away from that, but then in a certain way you miss it because you have these gallery shows now, and people don't like to tell you that they hate it to your face, so, you know, they say that they like the clouds or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's fine, but you kind of miss right. people analyzing your work when you work so hard to make it. Yeah, you want to be appreciated for the work that you put in. Yeah. I want people to think I'm smart, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I need to be mindful of the time here. Let's uh, go through maybe a couple more strips. Uh, and that's okay. Well, which, um, what are you guys most interested in? I would put these in here as a joke because uh, a few weeks ago you were telling me, like, how should I introduce you as an illustrator? And I was like, I really don't like the term illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because I'm really bad at taking jobs, like freelance jobs. I'm really terrible at doing what people ask me to do because so much of the comics, like, Again, they, it's this intuitive, pro I want it to just kind of go where it wants to go. So I don't feel like I'm illustrating an idea. I'm just watching it evolve and praying that it becomes something by the end. Um, so this was uh, Hrog from Hyperallergic months and months ago asked me if I could make them postcards mm -hmm. for them. And... I waited like weeks till I finally sent him this and then it was like it's a joke. You know, like I just couldn't do it. I almost gave up. And so I sent this and you just didn't reply and then I sent this one. Uh he didn't reply. And this one, yeah. Nothing. So I th I lost that job. Um yeah. That this is why I'm not an illustrator, I guess. <laughs> well, I think uh, the job title versus what your your ability. I don't know if those two should correlate. I think when somebody calls you an illustrator, they're speaking on your ability to be able to draw what you want to draw, as opposed to you know, yeah, I'm a jerk. I can't even tell you how many jobs I've lost just because I I get I don't know what it is. I can't do it. I I'll grow into it maybe where I can illustrate people's ideas. But I kind of don't want to. I still look at myself as an artist. An artist can do whatever the fuck they want, you know? I love that about our careers, right. our choices that we make. Um, so this was a comic I made kind of in the beginning, too. Um, people uh, tend not to respect cartoons in the art world. Uh, I think it's it's getting a lot more fuzzy of where cartoons start and where uh, painting begins or, or art, like with a capital A. Um, so this was my kind of rebuttal of the importance of humor in, in art um, or just elsewhere. Right. And it is an intellectual process. Be, having the ability to see humor in things means you have this deep understanding of it and can come out of it looking at a subject at large. You know, like, it's very important and I don't think people should poo-poo it as much as they 
often do, or don't take it seriously just because it's a joke. Right. You know, and so making the this is not a pipe kind of thing. That's a that's a joke. And Duchamp was making jokes, you know, but yeah, it was. Yeah, so definitely. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, do, do you want to show one more before we close this up, or? There we go. <laughs> uh, this didn't get shared very much. I was really disappointed. It's about um, so I I came into comics and got thrown into this internet world uh, that I wasn't. I'm not so prepared for. Though. These comics are very personal to me. Um, and there are trolls out there, and there are people that just love to hate. Um, so, I hope. So this video is going to be on the internet forever, isn't it? Uh, yes, pretty much. Yeah. So if we could like disable comments, that would be. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I I make conscious that I can't read the comment on Hyperallergic's Facebook anymore. I really, really avoid it because I get so upset, I take everything so personally. But sometimes people are like, you should fire this girl. I'm just like, why must you, be, why don't you just move on to the next article? Yeah, I, I think people are, uh, get to be uh, inappropriate uh, when it's to, to absolute strangers, yeah. uh, because they feel enough to do so, and it's got nothing to do with you personally. I think they just want to because they right. can. Right, there's, um, there's constructive criticism, but um, I'm weak. I don't know what happened in college. I was pretty good with taking critiques and and all that, but some somewhere in between, I know not everyone's gonna love it. It's not gonna be their thing. Um, but it really it sticks in your head when you get those those people, those invisible ghost people, looking right. at your comics and just putting you down because then you go into the next one like, oh, I don't know if I should do that because I'm putting a target on my back, you know? <laughs> um, you can't think that way, though. You just got to throw it out there and yeah. with your eyes, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's uh, wrap this up here. Uh, could we go back to uh, just seeing your face here? Uh, my face is... And the screen share. Here is my face. No? Uh, almost. Did that was. Yeah, here we go. All right, so um, thank you for that. Uh, let's uh, open up for questions. <laughs> oh, questions. Hey, guys. Hi. What's your names? I want to know names. Back. Really? Audrey. I can't even see Audrey. She's like. <laughs> hey, Audrey. All right. So, all right. Ladies, questions, comments? Not questions, but comments. I, I like that you put your heart and your life into your drawings and your writing. Thanks. You should, too. <laughs> I do. I mean, why, else, why else do it, you know? And we know ourselves the best, so. Exactly. Yeah. I don't have any question to, but I think I have some inspiration today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Do you want to talk about your wall behind you? Yeah. My wall. So this is my bedroom. I'll call it my studio. But I live in New York. I don't have room for that shit. Um, <laughs> this is just what I do. My whole apartment kind of looks like this. Um, is it kind of like an idea board? It's an attic space that the landlord doesn't really give a shit about, so I draw on the walls and paint on it. Um, okay. My pigeon over here. Just over my shoulder. I don't know, just things that I think are inspiring, or maybe not so inspiring. There's a picture of Hitler that I don't think you can see. <laughs> it's Hitler with a crow on his shoulder, and I just thought it was a really powerful image. But I tried to level out the uh, terribleness of that by putting George Gross up here, an artist that was very against Hitler, ostracized. Um, yeah. Got my anatomy going on. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, um, Lauren will be here uh, on in, uh, upcoming uh, 
uh, in January and February for uh, being an artist in resident. So you'll get yeah. to meet her and walk. I'm excited to meet you. Perfect. Yeah. Well, so, that was too exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really pretty excited. No, I'm, uh, I'm, really, I'm really excited about it. So, and I'll be stealing ideas from all of you and incorporating <laughs> you into comics probably. So be, okay with it. be careful about what you say. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, all right, so let's wrap this up here. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for your time. Uh, it's been a fantastic uh, interview, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Um, thank you. Now. Thanks again for having me. And if uh, more of our work, Lauren's work can be seen on Hyperallergic, uh, excuse me, hyperallergic.com and uh, laurenperge.com, uh, P-U-R-J-E. Um, so, uh, signing up. Thanks for being here. All right, thanks. <laughs>